Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me for this VMware Code Power Session. Today, I'm going to take you through developing a simple augmented reality application that's going to help you um, if you're a Lego fan out there or if uh, perhaps you're a Star Wars fan out there, given today is uh, May the 4th. Uh, we'll help you put together a land speeder, uh, actually Luke Skywalker's land speeder from A New Hope. So I'm not going to spend much time in PowerPoint at all. And actually, um, to start with, I'm going to jump straight into the demo, show you the application, and then we'll go and take a look behind the scenes and look at the code and uh, the, um, the scene, the Unity scene that uh, makes it all happen. So without further ado, let me switch over to the demo. So this is running on an Android device, which is um, here on my uh, connected to my computer, and I'm screaming the streaming the screen over from screen copy. So what I've got happening over here is uh, the application has detected that I've got the Lego instruction manual for this Star Wars set uh, on my desk. It's recognized it, and it's put the model there um, on top of the image. As I turn the pages here, it's going to detect that I'm moving to different stages of the manual. So here it notes that now I'm on uh, page five, which is the first page. It cleared away all the steps and put us back at the first step. Um, so what we can do here is we can keep advancing through the manual. As I go page by page, it will start drawing the step that it sees um, according to the page that's shown on the manual. And another thing I can do is you can't see what I'm doing here, but if I take my finger and tap on the image on the screen of my phone, it'll advance to the next step. So it says now it's on step 1.5. The one there means it's the first model in this uh, kit, which is uh, this little uh, bunker. And five means it's sub-step five of this particular model. I can keep advancing through the pages like this, and it'll keep animating along the steps that I need to go through. Now, this is the second sub-model, which is the actual land speeder. Um, let's walk through some of the steps here. So step one is to get that orange plate down. Step two is to add those curved bits over there. I want to add some more. We can actually get ahead of the steps that are on this page and keep iterating through. And the other cool thing we can do is we can jump ahead in the manual to, say, a completely different step. And it will fast forward through the steps until it gets to the, um, the, the one that we are seeing on the screen. Um, I have done a couple of things to make the demo go a little bit more smoothly. Number one is I've actually taped my manual down to my table. And that's so that I can fold one page down on the side like this. So the camera and the computer vision system are only seeing one page at a time. And I'll explain why I had to do that a little bit later. Um, but if it was not taped down, you'd actually be able to rotate this uh, page a little bit. And as you rotate it, the manual and the model would follow you around. So you could use, you could actually spin the manual around in order to get a different perspective on the model and the step that you're on right now. So it's saying right now it's on step uh, 40, uh, model number two, step 40, sub step number three. Um, so what I'm going to do now is walk you through how I built this app, what are the different components of uh, Unity and of C Sharp that I used to put all of this together. And so uh, let's get to it. Before we dive into the Unity editor and the code, I'm just going to um, exit out of this presentation here and show you the GitHub repo where all of the code has been posted. So this is the repository. I'm going to leave this link up for a while in case any of you want to follow along um, within GitHub. Uh, this is my personal GitHub page, Arjun Dubey. And uh, the project is called Master Build AR. Uh, a Lego master builder is uh, you know, the folks who are really, really good at making Lego models. And they put together the stuff you see in Legoland. So the idea is with this app, you too could be uh, a master builder anyway. Um, there's a few instructions here on project setup and how to use it, but I'm going to be going through all that in the video, so I'm not going to spend much time over here. Uh, this is an open source project, and I like to start any open source project by thanking, you know, uh, or acknowledging some other projects that inspired this project or helped me to get to this point. So there were two projects in particular that were really useful. One is uh, Unity's own AR Foundation samples. That's another open source project that I've linked to here in the description in the in the readme and that's over here this has very detailed steps on how to get started with AR foundation it has a link to all of their developer documentation which is pretty robust and uh, answers a, a lot of common questions like which version of unity should I use which is the IDE that you use to work with AR foundation um, and has uh, basically a number of examples on how to use their code and descriptions of how that uh, how these samples work I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. 
However, I do have a previous video that I made going into kind of a 101 level of what is Unity, what is AR Foundation, and you, you please feel free to check that video out. Uh, I've linked that in uh, my fork of the AR Foundation sample project, which is again in my Arjun Dube GitHub uh, space under the name AR Foundations. It's a direct fork. And here at the bottom, I've listed a number of tutorial videos to get yourself familiar with Unity. The video that I made myself, uh, which is uh, kind of a 101 introduction to Unity and AR Foundation working together. Uh, a number of articles and API references that might be useful. So feel free to go back and take a look at this page as well and this example, because um, I'm not going to cover uh, the material that was covered during this video uh, today. Uh, and uh, you should, uh, it's not a prerequisite per se, but it might help to get a, a deeper understanding of what Unity is and what AR Foundation is. So with all that being said, uh, let's jump straight into the code. Um, sorry, I forgot to mention, uh, one other project that I'd like to call out, an open source project is called the LDRAW Importer um, by a gentleman named Grigory uh, Dedichenko. And uh, he published this back in 2018. So what I've done is I've forked this project and um, from here. And I've uh, translated a few things to English in the README. And I've also enhanced the functionality a little bit and upgraded the project use 2019.3.10, which is the version of Unity that I'll be using for this demo as well. Um, and this is a really cool project that uses uh, an open source file format called LDRAW, uh, file extension .ldr, um, and another file extension called MDL, which is basically a text-driven format that allows you to specify what a LEGO model should look like and what an individual LEGO brick or piece of LEGO should look like. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of walk you through that format so you can understand better how we arrived at uh, the construction of this model. And the big advantage, obviously, of doing things this way and going from the data is that this can, in theory, represent any LEGO model. So you'd be able to update my fork of the project, pick your favorite building model, whatever it might be. It doesn't even need to be LEGO. So long as there is an LDRAW model backing it up, you would be able to go ahead and bring it into the project. So let me show you what one of these files looks like. Uh, here we go, Luke Skywalker's land speeder. Pop this open. And you'll see that it's just an enormous text file with various comments in it. Each of these is subcomponents of the position, scaling, and rotation of a particular um, object. So in this case, it's saying, this object needs to have this position, this rotation, this scale, and the details of this object are found in the file 6109.dat. So it's a nested data format. And what you end up getting is a nested structure within Unity of game objects that get created by the parsing of this format. Um, the enhancement that I've made on top of what was already done by Grigori is that I've added the ability to also understand not just the entire model as a whole and all the pieces that make it up together, but where are the step boundaries between uh, the different steps within this model? So this is the first step, the second step, the third step. You can think of these as comments in the file. If a uh, file has a leading line of zero, that means this is a comment. It doesn't need to result in a draw directive on the screen, but it tells my application that there's a step boundary here. And so uh, when I'm creating the animation, uh, which is another thing added to that project, when do I stop animating? When have I reached the next step in the, um, in, in the model? So let's go and see what happens when we consume this file. Well, the LDRAW importer code will take this file format, parse it, and turn it into a hierarchy of objects within your Unity scene. And this is what the hierarchy of objects actually looks like. You've got your um, root object over here, which is the, you know, the overall model, all the meshes and all the pieces for that model. And as you open this up, you have two submodels. So that was the bunker that I showed you and then the actual land speeder. And if you open up a submodel further, you'll see the individual Lego parts. So if I hide everything and just show this, this is that Lego plate that is the first base plate. And you can go even down, that was that file that I told you about, 6106.dat. Well, 6106.dat has a bunch of basically primitive CAD directives in here that tell you how to draw each and every piece of this Lego part. So it's all completely data-driven. This file format is, as I said, open source. And all of the instructions are uh, basic, all of these uh, files are kept up to date by a community, um, the LDRAW community. So big thanks to them and shout out to them for doing all this hard work 
which makes it much easier for me and other developers to go out there and build applications on top of this stuff. It's very, very useful and very, very cool. Um, and their website, which I will add, sorry, I didn't add that in the description, but it's ldraw.org. This is their homepage. And uh, I'll add this to the references section because this is really useful to kind of understand what this format is and you know how it's maintained and kept up. So thanks to all that great work, we have a 3D representation of the LEGO model. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the code that I added will now go through there. And whenever it finds one of those step content, uh, comments in the file, it adds a dummy uh, object, which doesn't render anything on the screen, but allows my application to know when a step has been reached within the, um, the LEGO instructions. So everything that, every step that you see in here maps to a particular step on the um, LEGO instruction manual that I have. So for example, uh, actually, I'll get to that a little bit later. The step has, uh, the in the first video that I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a bunch of information about the Unity editor and how it works and how to use Unity ID in general. But just to give you a little bit of catch up, this is called the scene, the Unity scene. And within the Unity scene, we have several objects. And each object has a nested hierarchy below it. So everything within this object is relative to its parent object and so on and so forth. The objects can have behaviors on them, which are nothing but C-sharp scripts. And the behaviors control how the objects behave. Um, so we have two behaviors on this object. We have a submodel behavior, which says this object is some kind of a Lego model. And we have a stepper, which is what allows you to advance forward and backward through the steps. So this is the code that actually does the stepping. This is another submodel. This is a nested submodel within the first submodel. And these are individual parts, which don't have any scripts on them. And the third script that I have is called a step. So I'm going to walk through the fields on each of these objects. A submodel has only one public field, which is telling you which part am I currently focused on as I'm stepping through this model. So right now I'm on part zero because I haven't done anything. I haven't done any of the steps here. So it's saying zero is the, is the number. The stepper has only one public field, which is which step do you want me to go to? And it uses the same dot version notation to identify the steps. So in this case, I'm saying go to step 2.67, which happens to be the last step in the model. And I'll show you what happens when I go to the last step in the model. I've written everything here so that you can run it on your computer as well. And that really helps to do any debugging and troubleshooting before you get into pushing the build to your Android device. Because once it's on the device, it's a little bit harder to work with. And it's much easier to do everything with a debugger available um, and on your PC. So let's see what it looks like when you run through it on the PC. And I'll walk through some of these additional fields as well while we do that. So when you're in Unity, you can hit this Play button. And it'll run your game within the context of the editor. And that means you get full access. You can attach Visual Studio to it and debug it. Um, you can see all of this metadata on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, which you can't see when you're running the actual game. So it's a very handy way to kind of debug your game. So once this starts up, um, it's going to start populating some of these, uh, some of those fields that I told you about. OK, so now the application itself is running. Because it's running on a computer, I've set up some keyboard shortcuts. Instead of using augmented reality to tell it which step you're on, I type things in on my keyboard. So you won't see what I'm typing, but I'll tell you what I'm doing in every step. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to clear all the parts away. So I've mapped that to the C key. When I hit C, everything is going away. And what you probably noticed here on the left-hand side is things started grayed out. And in the Unity world, that means that don't render this object. So I have my stepper script has actually gone through and said, for every part, just hide it. Because we are on step zero, part zero, nothing to show here. Um, the F key is bound to advancing to the next step. So as I press F, I'll see the first step of the first submodel, which is that base plate that I showed you, part 6106. Then I can keep adding parts to it. Now, you'll notice that the parts are actually animating into place. I didn't have to do anything to set up this animation. Um, uh, at least I didn't have to do anything manual. Every step has um, basically some default parameters that tell it how it should be animating your uh, model. So the default parameter for these LEGO animations is to just go straight down. So if I don't specify anything, it'll just make the part go straight down, and it won't um, uh, basically won't uh, move it sideways or anything else like that. But as we step through this, um, 
you can see that there's a part here that doesn't want to go straight down. Let me reverse and do that again. It wants to go from the outside in. So let's see what that looks like. So that's this part over here, right? As I go backwards, it gets hidden. And then over here, you can see that I've specified an animation direction. And I've said, I want you to go negative one in the Z direction. That means from our point of view, it means go backwards. So that's what the part does. Instead of going up to down, it just flies backwards into that part over there. Then the very next step after that, I say, I want you to go down again. And so for that one, it's saying go down minus one in the Y direction. I've specified an override here to go minus one in the Y direction, but I actually didn't need to because that's the default behavior. Now I'm done with this particular sub model. I'm done with the bunker part of the build. So when I go to the next step, it pushes that model back to its final position. And that's also controlled by the step. So there's a sub model step. It's a step right after the sub model that tells it how to animate the sub model. So it's saying when you're done with this whole sub model, go back. Uh, you know, 30 in the Z direction, which basically pushes it back over there. The other thing that you'll see here is that there's a number field that I've added. Uh, there's a number field for each step. Now, this number field is actually automatically populated. It counts down through all the steps and adds a number for you. But sometimes you want to add additional steps to make your model a little bit more clear as to what it's doing. And so I've added the ability to go in here and change the step number manually. So you could say, you know, I want to actually break down step 1.2 into three sub-steps. And so you can specify that the, se the step number should stay at 1.2 for all of these three steps. And only once those three steps are finished, go to step 1.3. Because uh, in Lego manuals and in many manuals, sometimes they concatenate two or three different steps together into one move. For example, if you look at this step over here, you've got two parts coming down here. And that's one step. Uh, if that was confusing to somebody building the model, you could even break it up into two parts by overriding the step number. But for the most part, you don't need to touch the step number. You also don't need to touch the animation direction. It'll default animate from the top slightly downwards. So let's walk through this again. We're done with this part. We're going to send it to the back. Now we start with the second submodel. Um, I've also added WSAD keys to move the camera around while we're in the editor so we can more clearly focus on what's going on on the screen. So this is working right pretty well. Um, there's another submodel over here which is submodel number two. That's the one that we're on right now. And we're, as you can see, we're stepping through the steps. We're going to keep going until we hit a sub submodel. So now submodels can also have submodels in them. And the concept there is that it'll create the submodel in a particular start position. It'll allow you to build it in its own frame of reference. Like I said, all Unity objects have nested frame of references. So in this frame of reference, up and down is actually going this way. You can see it pressing in. So if I go and open up the submodel and look at the step here, I didn't have to change the animation direction because the default up and down works. And the reason that works is because this whole thing is rotated 90 degrees in the negative Z direction, which is what makes it lay flat like that. And so that makes it really handy because you don't really have to do much in terms of annotating the steps manually. There's very few instances when um, this will parse through one of those LDRAW files and do something wrong. And you can see it pretty quickly while you're stepping through the steps. So that's why I added the ability to manually go through them. So you can review the model that you've created and make sure that it's animating correctly. That last step was to push the whole submodel down into place. Uh, the last thing that I'm going to show you is how to skip to a particular uh, animation. So what I've done is I've said on the stepper, take me to step 2.67, the last step in the model, and I hit the X key. So let's do that. Hit X, and it'll basically just fast forward through the whole animation. So we can see the whole Lego model coming to life, um, you know, step by step. It should just take a few seconds. Um, I, I play a step every 0.1 seconds. And so where all of this comes into play is as you page through the model, if a user is paging through their model and they happen to skip a particular page, the animations will fast forward to the page that they're on rather than forcing them to sequentially go step by step. But you also give them the ability to press step, 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 uh, to tap the screen one step at a time and go through the steps of the model one step at a time manually if they so choose. So they have both options. They can use the manual as a quote unquote controller for their um, building experience, or they can use the, the tapping the button on the screen. And the reason I gave them these two uh, ways of doing things is so I could highlight two different capabilities of uh, AR Foundation, basically, and two different ways in which you can uh, do user interaction. One last thing I'll talk about in terms of, uh, which is specific to uh, Lego models and to this project, is the animations themselves that you were, sawing, uh, that you were seeing. So every part and every sub-model has an animation component added to it. 
And that animation component is what's responsible for pushing the parts into their final destinations. And I'll show you how those get populated, but they're all done in code. These are all data-driven dynamic animations. Nothing is created um, statically or beforehand. It interprets the LDRAW file and the overrides that you've put into each and every step uh, here. And it takes all that information, combines it together, and turns it into an animation, basically. So it's a data-driven animation. Um, so we've, uh, you know, we've looked a lot at Unity. Why don't we take some time and look at the code itself and see how that works? So we'll start with um, the stepper itself. That's probably the most, uh, that's the outermost level of abstraction, right? So the stepper is attached to the root model, and that's responsible for moving the uh, animation forward and backward through the steps of the model. This is the, when you want a field of your, um, your C Sharp class to show up in the Unity editor and allow people to change the value by typing into the Unity editor, you use this uh, annotation called serialize field, and you can also add tooltips to it. Uh, you may also just set your uh, field to public, and then it will show up by default in the inspector. But I feel like making your internal state public is a recipe for trouble, because it allows other classes that are consuming your class to go and touch your internal state. And that may not be what you want. They may uh, cause something bad to happen. Um, so having, having this ability to set things via the inspector basically allows you to collect configuration from the user before the application starts and allows you to avoid having a big constructor with a lot of different property setters going on in it. Everything can then be customized without changing the code. So you can think of this as a way to parameterize your application so it can be changed uh, before it's run without changing the code. There's some internal state to the stepper that says, what is my root model? Um, it assumes that the one that it's attached to is the root model. And um, there's also a ready flag just to make sure that the steps have all been numbered and they've been hidden from sight before you start paging through the animations. In my other video, I talk a little bit about the Unity lifecycle. So every C Sharp script that inherits from a mono behavior has a specific lifecycle. It goes through uh, the state of awake when it wakes up start when it starts to um, render, uh, starts to update basically, and update is the function that gets called every single frame. Typically, you want to initialize your object and objects dependencies in the awake function. The start function is when um, you may want to call any uh, initialization methods. So, you know, set all your variables up here. This is where you'd call any code, typically. Uh, it's not set in stone, but there's a guaranteed order of execution Awake will always be called on all of the objects that are present in a scene before start is called. But there's no guarantee when start of object A is called versus start of object B, or rather, there are only weak guarantees. And so because of that, you can use the awake and start um, in order to make sure that uh, there are no race conditions in your code. Uh, as I said, the update loop is called once per frame. And I'm using that right now to get the user input, which is not a very efficient way of doing things, but this is just a debug mode that's used to um, make sure that your animations all look correct. So it's OK to do it this way. Um, these are basically just APIs that allow Unity to check uh, if the user has hit a key during that particular frame. And this is not a press and hold kind of hit. So you have to, even if you're pressing and holding the key, it'll count that only as one input until you lift off and press down again. That's why the method is called get key down. So the C code clears the steps. F goes to the next step. R for reverse goes to the previous step. And X jumps to the step that you want to go to. So let's look at these particular functions. Clear steps actually goes to the root model and calls, tells it to prepare all of its steps, and it passes a Boolean flag of true, which is saying clear everything. I'll show you there's another way of calling this function that doesn't um, clear everything, and that's prepare steps with false. The reason you may want to do this is when I showed you the demo, the very first thing that we saw when the manual was first recognized by the uh, phone's computer vision system is it showed the completed model sitting there on the first page. And so we wanted, I wanted to enable that use case. So when the model first showed up, I don't want all the parts to be disabled, but I want it to be ready to accept if the user were to suddenly switch to another page or to tap the screen, I want the model to be ready to move to the next stage of the uh, animation. Um, and this is just in general, when you're working with augmented reality, a good practice is to anticipate that things um, that you may have to handle user input um, you know, in a very asynchronous way, because uh, you're always responding to the environment. You're responding to what the camera can see or what the IMU is sensing as the user moves their device through the scene. And so you have to be very reactive and make sure that your code is um, 
no, sorry, it's better to make your code very defensive. So uh, you're able to account for all those particular scenarios. Um, get current step is similarly very simple. It just goes to the root model and says, give me the current step that you're on. Next step says, go to the next step of the root model. Previous step goes to the previous step of the root model. Pretty straightforward so far. The animation part, which is going to a particular step, this one gets a little bit more complicated, but not too bad. Let's walk through what's going over here, going on over here. The first thing we do is call this method called stop all coroutines. So that would require understanding what a coroutine is. Unity encourages developers to write their applications in a particular way. And one of the paradigms that they espouse is if you're doing anything that needs to be rendering anything onto the screen or using Unity's API surface, you need to do it on one thread, the UI thread. And so um, they have a separate render thread, but they've got a main thread of the application, right? So you need to use that main thread if you, uh, if you want to send any instructions to draw something on the screen. And so the way they've come up with doing that is uh, basically a time slicing approach you can create what's called a coroutine that's given a certain slice of time to run, then it exits out at a predefined point within its execution, and then it'll be resumed from that point of execution during its next time slice. So that's what this animation coroutine is doing. It's saying, uh, run this coroutine, which is called go to step coroutine. That takes as an input, what step do you want me to go to? And what it'll do is um, it'll get the current step, and um, if there's no current step, then it knows that you haven't even started yet. So it'll just automatically push you to the first step. That's all that's happening over here. But the important code is over here. While the step number is less than the current steps number, it goes and calls previous step. And then what it does over here is where the time slicing comes into play. This yield return tells Unity that you know I've finished processing uh, my time slice. I want to be called back after wait for seconds, number of seconds. So I've set it to 0.2 seconds. So every two seconds, it'll advance to a next step. And it's kind of a quick speed, but the idea behind this is you're fast forwarding or fast rewind, uh, rewinding through the steps of the model. So that's why it's kind of fast. And the same thing if you want to go the other way. If the step number that uh, you want to get to is higher than the one that the model is currently on, then keep pushing through until you get to the step that you want to get to. Again, pretty straightforward. Um, Nothing too crazy here, but coroutines are kind of a very Unity specific thing. So I thought I'd delve into that in a little bit more detail. So let's move on again really quickly. Let's look at the step um, class. This is basically a container for all the preferences that a user has, uh, anything that you would like to override in terms of how a step should behave. So as I said, most of these have a default behavior that's gonna work just fine for you. The default direction to move a step is to go downwards. The default um, uh, of whether something is a sub-step is false. So for the most part, it assumes that if it sees a step in the LDRAW file, that's a real step in the model, and it maps to a real instruction on the LEGO instruction page. Uh, you may want, as I said, you may want to set this to true if you want to break a step down into sub-steps, but typically you don't need to do that. And then this number field is populated by the program. You don't need to set this up at all. Um, but the field is there in case you need to override its behavior. I like to use c -sharp properties whenever I have um, state that needs to be consumed in other classes, just to give my a little bit more control in terms of getters and setters, behavior upon those getters and setters, uh, and to not expose my private internal state to other classes. So I've got properties backing each of these. Um, I've got one extra property here, which is the number version. And what that is doing is basically using a version string, which is a.b.c.d, basically that format. And the reason I'm using that is because they've got a really nice comparison operator. So I can easily compare between when you're at step 2.53.5, is that lower than or higher than step 2.51.2? And it'll just spit that out for me. So I didn't have to write any code to do that. And I know that most LEGO models don't go more than two nested sub-steps. Uh, just from my experience of building LEGOs, they may add one someday, in which case this would throw a bunch of nasty exceptions, but uh, I haven't seen one yet. The public API of step itself, I'm not going to go into the implementations of these because they're a little bit more complicated, but the public API is just plain animation. So once I've parsed all these properties that the user has provided or that are automatically set up as defaults, I'll use those to put together a Unity uh, animation. And that Unity animation is what will drive the part to move in the direction that it needs to move in. Um, the main thing that I want to show you here is how you create an animation. So um, you're basically creating a number of curves. Uh, and these curves are just simple mathematical functions that say, move from this value 
to this value over this amount of time. And you can specify uh, easing using these curves. So I've got linear animations all the way through. If you like to have a little bit more easing, you can use an ease in or ease out function or any really any function you would like to drive your animation. Um, there are many, many such functions. There's a ping pong function that causes the animation to keep playing back and forth. So there's many things you could do here. I just opted for the most simple option, which is to create these linear, very simple linear animations. And moreover, these simple linear animations only control direction, no rotation, uh, only movement. And that's because of the way Lego is constructed. When parts are put together, they slide onto each other. They always slide onto each other. There's at least no parts that I can immediately think of that screw into each other or connect in any other uh, unusual ways. Or there are a few sometimes there are rubber bands and other things. But the vast majority of Lego parts are designed to simply snap together. So this very simplistic animation schema was enough to cover all of the parts in this model, and it worked perfectly. So that's how you create an animation at runtime. If you want to create a more sophisticated animation, Unity has a very, very rich animation framework called Mechanim. Not going to get into that at all here. Um, there's plenty of documentation on how to use it. I didn't use that because it's not really built for runtime animations. It's really built to do to create a very rich animation at compile time. For example, how does this particular character walk? How does he transition from walking to running? What happens when he trips? What happens when he sits down or she sits down? Uh, these are not considerations that uh, I had for this particular application. So I use their uh, so-called legacy animation system, which is very scriptable. Um, and as uh, all developers know, we like scriptable things. I'm not going to get too much into the rest of the details of this in the interest of time. Um, the code is up all on GitHub uh, if you want to take a closer look through how it works. The last thing I'll show you is the submodel itself. This is where all the interesting stuff really happens. Um, this is where the steps are prepared. So it goes through all the steps, sets all the step numbers, and um, any other properties that need to be set. Animation properties, for example, might be set in here. Um, it's basically initializing the whole structure. Um, this is the function that does the next step. And it has a mirror function called previous step. These are recursive functions, because the data structure that we're going through is a recursive data structure. Um, so as a result, it can be a little bit tricky to kind of understand what's going on here. I'm not going to go through both of them because they're essentially mirror each other pretty closely. Um, but I'm just going to talk about how um, get current step works because this is the simplest uh, scenario, right? So if I want to know what step a model is, what I would do is I would check, you know, which part is this uh, this particular model on. If that part happens to be a step, then that's what I need to return. Pretty straightforward. But this may be a nested case. In the nested case, what I need to do is actually get the submodel. And then ask the submodel, what is the current step that you're on? And then I return the current step of the submodel back. Now, you might say, well, you're missing, wait a minute, you're missing something here. You haven't appended the step from this model uh, onto the result. And yes, you're right, I haven't done that. And the reason I haven't had to do that is because when I was doing this, I put that the burden of doing that into this preparation function. So that's why there's a prefix that gets passed over here. And this prefix is used to keep inter incrementing the uh, dot version numbers so that you get this nice nested uh, version numbers without having to do any other magic. And that makes this function very, very simple. Um, next step, similarly, is recursive. So it'll go and ask, it'll figure out what part you're currently on. Um, if the part that you're on is a step, then it'll just bump you over to the next, the next thing after the step. And that's when this for loop comes in. So the for loop says, until I encounter another step, I'm just going to go through all the steps and animate them. Pretty simple, right? So it gets the part. If it's a step, stop, play the animation, return true. You're done. If it's a nested submodel, go through the nested submodel and hit next step on the submodel until the submodel is done and out of steps, and then you're done. And if it's neither a step nor a submodel, just go and show the um, show the part that you're supposed to show. And so between all the parts will be set as active. They'll appear in the scene. You'll reach the step. It'll say, play the animations for all those parts that you just uh, set to active. So it'll go and do that. And then you'll see that nice animation play. So that's all next step is doing, recursing uh, through that entire structure and doing what it needs to do. Um, you don't get to use recursion a lot. Uh, it's not often a good choice, I would say, um, to solve simple problems. But it was a perfect fit for this particular domain. So. Um, this is this code is also uh, um, you know a way to get your 
uh, recursion fix if you if you really like recursion like I do um, and, and see how that works. So that's basically all of the code around presenting the animations to the user. And now we've got this API, uh, top level API on the stepper, which allows you to do to clear all your steps, go to the next step, go to the previous step, or go random access to any particular step. So how does this tie into augmented reality? That's the next part that we're going to focus on. Um, so to, to get to that part, we're going to look at another class that I've created called the Tracked Instruction Manager. But before we get into the code here, I'm now going to open my augmented reality scene. So this scene was my debug scene. I use this to do things within the Unity editor so I can debug the instructions and make sure the animations look good. And all of this is actually from the LDRAW importer um, Git, GitHub project that I mentioned. Uh, I have made my own fork of it. So this is a copy of my fork that's within nested within this project. Um, there are other ways to bring code within your Unity project, but this is probably the simplest way to do it, um, kind of like a Git sub module, essentially. Um, so the, all, all of the code that handles steps is my addition to the LDRAW importer subproject. So if you use the base uh, GitHub repo that was uh, created the, before my fork, you won't get the animations, but mine adds the animations on top. So I wanted to walk through the delta between uh, between those two, so you know why I had to create a fork of this uh, repo. All right, now we get into the actual augmented reality project. So let's start with the Unity scene again, because that's really where everything is specified. I'm going to pop this scene open. So there's nothing in the scene, so that might strike you as strange. Um, the reason for that is, as I said, augmented reality applications are very reactive. They react to their environment. So when there's nothing of interest to the application in the environment, it displays nothing. Um, and that's exactly what's going on over here. You've got an AR session, which is all the state that is kind of encapsulates the uh, augmented reality session on the device. You've got the session origin, which in most cases is where your device started in 3D space. So it just kind of gives you an anchor point of um, you know, where 000 is in, in the real world, is where your phone was when you started the app or your headset device, uh, although we'll get to cross-platform in a little bit. And within there, you've got this uh, thing called the AR camera. The AR camera represents your phone uh, or the, your HMD, your headset head-mounted device, as it moves through the scene. So as the camera moves around, as your phone moves around, this camera object moves around within the AR session object uh, and uh, within the coordinate space of the AR session origin. Sorry. Uh, so let's take a look at what code and what scripts are on this AR session origin. We've got the AR session origin itself. We've got something called an AR Raycast Manager. This is an AR Foundation primitive that's documented in their documentation. I'll just pop open their documentation right here in Raycasting. So they've got a pretty nice um, set of documentation for all of these primitives that I'm going through, which is why I won't really go into too much detail around them. This is the AR session itself. This is the subsection about Raycasting. So what this thing is is basically um, a utility that allows you to cast rays out from your device's position into the real world and see if they intersect anything. Um, they may either intersect detected real world geometry, so planes, 3D objects, um, images that it detects, or it may uh, intercept um, virtual elements that you have created within the scene. Uh, I'm using uh, a raycaster that's designed to detect, uh, designed to intersect with real objects in the scene. And uh, that's why I'm using their AR Raycast Manager. Otherwise, I'd use a normal Raycast if I wanted to intersect with virtual objects. This one is kind of specialized. The other thing that I have here is an AR Tracked Image Manager. So this object in the scene is basically saying, give me a collection of images that you want me to be interested in. And when I find any one of these images, I'm going to fire an event. And if you consume that event, you'll know uh, what image I've, I've seen. There's also a parameter here which says, what's the maximum number of images that are moving around in the scene? I set that to one, um, only one image at a time. And there's also a uh, what's called a prefab, which is basically saying, what do you want me to show you uh, when I see that particular image? And a prefab is basically a baked game object with all of the properties and settings already set in it. So you can use that baked game object rather than, um, rather than have to uh, create something in code all the time. So let's go take a look at that first. What do we create whenever we find a particular image? This is the prefab. Um, and like I said, it's nothing but a collection of game objects. So what I've got here is I've got a plane, and I've got a canvas. Uh, I cover some of these objects, uh, some of these uh, primitives, in, in again, in the earlier video. 
not going to go into too much detail, but a canvas allows you to draw a 2D UI, and a plane is a plane. There's not much more to it. Now, what's interesting about the plane and the canvas is how they've been set up. Both of these have a rotation. The plane is rotated 300 degrees, and that's because its default orientation is to be flat. So I've rotated it up towards the camera like this, and that gives that effect of the instructions floating in space um, rotated towards you, rotated towards the, the camera angle. The canvas had to be rotated only 30 degrees, and that's because the default orientation of the canvas is straight up and down facing you. So I just had to tip it back a little bit. Um, but both of them were rotated about the x-axis because that's the axis that runs this way across your coordinate frame. So I've just tilted both of them back the correct amount. In addition to tilting them back, I've also applied a bit of translation to them. So I've moved them a little bit up, y up, and z back. And the reason I did that was so the instructions appear to the, the, um, the image that I show you on the screen appears to be contiguous with the instructions, the image instructions that are detected. So let me raise my hands a little bit so you can see them. If this is the image that is detected, I want the instructions to show up tilted back, a little bit higher, and a little bit further back. So it looks like you have the instructions here, and then you've got the image that the instructions came from down here, and the model sitting on it. So that's the impetus behind the setting of these properties. There's not much else more to this uh, object, so I'm going to get back out of here, back to the scene. Um, the other thing we've got here is basically the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the logic behind the entire application is in this one monolithic script. It was nice to just keep everything in one place so that I could run through this whole file from top to bottom and walk you through what I'm doing in every particular part of things that are set up over here. Uh, this thing wants to know where the camera is, that canvas, that text on it, where the camera is, because that canvas needs to know if the camera is pointed at it. Uh, the other thing it's got is this uh, checkered material, which is just the default material. If you perhaps forgot to add one of the instructions to this reference image library, then it'll show a default image. But if you've got all your instructions in there, then it will show all the actual images from the manual. It's got the prefab of the model itself. So this is the same model that I showed you in the other scene, animating step by step by step through all the instructions. It's saying, create this thing whenever you see an instruction. And so that's exactly what the app does. And a few offset, uh, you know, positional, rotational, and scale offsets that it uses um, in order to um, position the model in the right place. The reason I had to add this is people set up their LDRAW models in different orientations and different ways. And so if you really wanted to show up correctly to the user, you may need to take control over the position, the rotation, and the scale of the model to get it looking the way you want it. Because it's really up to the person who produced the file. And it's an open source format. People produce them at different scales for different purposes. So um, that's a good example of putting something in the Unity editor so you can make changes without having to change the code. Um, OK, so let's go and take a look at how this thing actually works. We've got two funny annotations up here, which is called require component. And that's saying, in order for my code to work, I need to have an AR track image manager and an AR Raycast manager already on the same object. I'm dependent, it's basically a way of saying depends on, right? You're saying this behavior depends on these two behaviors. And then Unity will enforce at uh, basically a compile time that if these two things are not already there, it won't allow you to add this to an object, which is very handy. That allows you to get by a bunch of error checking. So you can just do things like, when I awake, just go and get the tracked image manager and the Raycast manager, and you can be assured that they will be there. Um, and I like to take any guarantees that I can get, right? Um, one less source of errors is a good thing for me. There are a couple of constants here. Nothing particularly interesting except for this uh, base scale. You'll notice a negative one here. And that is because the code that uh, Grigori wrote to parse that LDRAW or MDL file and create um, 3D graphics in Unity has to translate from a left-hand side, you know, bottom left corner coordinate system, which is what LDRAW uses, to Unity's coordinate system, which is from the middle out. Um, little uh, Silicon Valley reference for you guys there. Um, so, it, uh, sorry, bottom top left to bottom left, I believe, or something like that. And you know, the quick and dirty way that he found to do this was to just inverse the x-axis scale. That gets the model looking the way that it's supposed to look without having to do a bunch of rather tricky mathematics behind the scenes. Um, so it's a, you know, it's a little uh, 
kind of wart in the code, but it makes the rest of the code much, much, much simpler. And you've got this dictionary here, which is a, another manual step that you have to do. You have to say for a particular page number, for example, page number seven, the first step on that page is 1.4. For page number 13, the first step is 2.6. And you probably notice something, there's only odd numbers in this list. And the reason there are only odd numbers is, again, it's a shortcut that I took so that the camera only ever sees one instruction sheet at a time. Um, and I didn't want to have to keep flipping the manual over back and forth. So I said, OK, just recognize the odd number pages. I can stick it on my desk um, as it is uh, in the, let me show you real quick. I can stick it, it's basically you know, taped to my desk here. And I'll be sure that way that the system is not seeing both pages and getting confused about what step it's on. It's reasonably reliable. Usually, it doesn't get confused, but um, you know, just a little bit of added extra precaution to make the live demo go smoothly. All right, let's talk about those customizable behaviors that we went, uh, fields that we went through. We've got the camera that's needed for rendering the UI. We've got the default texture in case we don't know what the model image is supposed to look like. We've got the model itself we want to create and those offsets that I talked about. Um, it might be actually helpful to go back to the application here. I can get it to uh, cooperate. So as I'm going through the different pages here, you'll see it fast forwarding and reversing through the animations. So it's trying to get to the page that I'm on. So the UI here is missing, and the reason that it doesn't have heights of where this page is. And when the confidence hide the image, because I don't want to have a weirdly skewed and offset image. Um, that was you are, but just a little shortcut that I took. Um, let's go back here. But it's using that model offset, rotation offset, and model scale to place the model in the correct place in relation to the image that it's found. Uh, we already spoke about the tracked image manager and the raycast manager. In addition to that, we have another few pieces of internal state. We have what is the current page of instruction that you're on right now? I'll show you how that gets populated. We've got this uh, list of raycast hits, which is all the places where a raycast shot into the screen may have been hit by the uh, may have been uh, may have hit a uh, a real world object. We have the model itself and the stepper, um, stepper script on the model, which we used to step forward and back through. We talked about the awake function. Um, we have this interesting syntax here, on enable and on disable. These are all part of the Unity lifecycle. Apart from awake, you can say when some script has been enabled and disabled, that's a very good place to go and ha uh, wire up all your event listeners. And that's where I'm wiring up my event listeners for the AR tracked image managers on track image changed event. So let's go look at on track image changes right now. So what this function is doing is it's been given three lists, basically. Each list is the list of images that have been added in this uh, uh, event handler, the ones that have been updated, so moved around, or, or uh, you know, if you lose tracking confidence for them, or the ones that have been removed. This, there's a caveat here with the removed. It does not seem to get called on at least on Android um, for a very long time. So you may think that as soon as an image goes out of view, you would get a nice uh, method call here saying this image is now being removed, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And so I was not able to rely on that, which is the reason why um, I had to take a few um, kind of shortcuts in, in the code here. So the shortcut that I took is when I see an image in added, right? That, that means it's a novel image. It's an image the computer vision system hasn't seen before. And so for the purposes of this demo, I just had the user proceed in an orderly fashion through the instruction manual from the beginning to the end without going backwards. And so I know that every time I see a new image, that must be the next page that they've come to. Ideally, what I'd like to do is for the user to even be able to page backwards. So if they went back to a previous page, it should now recognize that page and be able to show you. But because I'm not being told when images are going out of view, when they're being removed, it became very tricky to try and do that without some kind of age cache mechanism that would throw pages out if they had not been seen for a while or something like that. And I didn't really want to make this code base too complicated to parse. I wanted to keep it quite simple. So I took that shortcut. Um, the other method that I'm doing here is I'm going through all of the instruction pages that have been updated. So when I get a tracking update, and I'm using that to show or hide the pages uh, accordingly. So let's go take a look at these 
uh, helper functions one by one. The first thing I do is when I see a, a, an instruction page for the first time, I say, okay, this is the instruction that the user is on now. I set up the instruction. So setting up the instruction is pretty straightforward. I just set up that world camera and I tell the UI of that instruction. Each instruction has its own UI attached to it. Another optimization you could do is just have one single UI that gets attached to the instructions. Um, didn't, didn't bother with that. But because of that, what I have to do is I have to tell each one where the camera is. I have to give it a scale. And the reason I have to give it a scale is because I need to let the computer vision system tell me how big the image is in real world uh, coordinates. And so I'm giving it a default scale of one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter, very tiny, um, just so that it doesn't blow up you know, and look enormous. And then once we get the real information from the underlying system, um, then I can update the size to be the actual real world size. But it's just a, kind of a, a starting parameter, so it's not too big. Um, what happens next? We update the instruction. So in update instruction, we go through, we basically parse that game object hierarchy, which is in that prefab that I showed you, the plane, the canvas, the text box. And we only show it under the specific conditions. If the image is the current instruction, the page that you're looking at, and the tracking state is good, uh, is either uh, tracked or limited, but not none. That means the computer vision can see it somewhere. It has some confidence. Then we basically set it to active. So the reason I have to do this is the system is not telling me when images are removed. So for all the images that have not been removed, I need to make sure that they're hidden. And I want it to only show the one and only one image that is the current instruction. And I, in addition, I only want to do that when I know that I have high confidence tracking. I mean, I have some non-zero confidence of tracking information on it. So that's why I'm saying make sure it's not in a non-tracking state. Bit of a hack, but it allows you know me to work with the limitations of the API. Uh, I haven't actually tested this on iOS, and uh, the Magically build currently doesn't work. I'm waiting. There's uh, another rev of their Magically package that needs to come out. It's, there's a compile time break in it right now. Um, so I haven't tested it on those two other platforms. But that's really the big win with AR Foundation. You can take the same application and run it on an iOS device. Um, should work. I again, haven't tested it, but uh, uh, you, listeners out there, you're welcome to try it out and let me know, and I can fix anything that's wrong with it. Or you can, you know, feel free to contribute. Um, and uh, that's that's really the power of this framework is that it creates all of these um, abstractions over the low-level primitives of the SDKs of each of these particular devices. Um, so that's what happens when the track image changes. Pretty straightforward. The only one other thing I wanted to show you here is. Uh, Oh, yeah. And the other thing we do is uh, when we see a page in the instruction uh, and we mark it as the current instruction, we also have to update the model to be mentioned here. We get the page number. Uh, we're just doing a, a little bit of a hack here as well, where we name the image by its page number. So we can do it in parse. If it's the very first page and there's no model showing up, just go ahead and create the model. That's all this code does and get the stepper and wire it up so that we can use that stepper later on. It doesn't do anything else. If we're on page five, which is that um, you know the page which had the bag being opened and all the parts coming out, it clears all the steps, so resets the model to its base state. And then you know, just basically go to the dictionary that I mentioned right at the top here, get the page number out for any other page that is detected, find out what step you're supposed to be on, and just hit go to. So that's all the code does, go to step and the value that comes out of the dictionary. Uh, and the last thing is uh, that I wanted to show you here is, well, how did I enable that button press interaction? Um, there are probably many ways I could have done that. The simplest possible thing to do is, because it's a touch screen device, I could have detected a touch anywhere on the device screen. But I wanted to really show a feature of AR Foundation, which is their raycasting ability. Um, so what I've implemented is that when you touch the device, and the ray that you cast does not hit the page of the instruction manual, it does nothing. Um, so if you hit anywhere except the page, uh, it won't trigger the next step. But if you hit on the page, it will trigger the next step. Again, not really a good reason to do that in this application. But one thing you could imagine is if you hit on the page, go to the next step. If you hit off the page, go to the previous step. So you've created kind of a simple forward back mechanism, right? Um, you could make things much more sophisticated. You could say, if the user hits, um, let's go back here. If they touch this particular area, this hot zone, right? Go to that particular sub step because some pages have multiple steps on them. For example, this one. 
it's got number 60, 61, and 62 on it. So if I hit a ray that, uh, you know, if I cast a ray that intersects number 61, go to 61. If I go to 60, go to 60. You could make it pretty sophisticated. Again, for the purposes of the demo, I kept it really, really simple. How does that work? Uh, what that does is basically, I try to get the touch position. Um, this pattern is basically return a bool if you can get a value where the user is touching a screen. If the user isn't touching, return false, so it skips this code entirely. Uh, just uh, kind of a nice uh, pattern that I've used in the past dealing with um, Unity uh, AR projects because, as I said, these apps are dynamic and reactive, so you don't always have guaranteed access to all of your state variables and, and things. Uh, it depends on what the camera can see. So if the user is touching the screen, what I do is I use that Raycast manager that I mentioned to send a ray out into the real world from the touch position on the screen, get the hit pose, and I simply advance to the next step. Like I said, I could make it more sophisticated uh, and make it do different things depending where on the image this hit pose is, because now I have a hit pose and I can compare that to the coordinate system of the detected, the current instruction, and say, well, okay, if it's to the left of the center, go forward. If it's to the right of the center, go back. You could do many things, right? Um, and the only other interesting thing here is when I create the Raycast, I'm saying intersected with images that are in the real world. You can set this uh, flag to be a number of different values. Uh, I've chosen image, but if you go and look at the definition here, there's a bunch of values that it has. You can say all planes, all estimated planes, everything, um, only faces. So you can use this Raycast for quite a few different things to enable user interaction in your apps, uh, the most basic forms of user interaction. So that kind of concludes the code walkthrough here. I know I've gone quite a bit over time. Um, I wanted to stop here, actually, and ask if uh, there were any questions from people um, or anything that you'd like to delve further into. And again, apologies for going a little bit over 15 minutes over time. I uh, didn't want to rush through it too much. Um, and if you uh, uh, put your questions out to Kripa, she'll uh, text them to me. Oh, no questions on YouTube. Looks like we are all good here. Um, I'm going to wrap this up then. Thank you very much for joining me. And um, have a great uh, May the 4th. Bye-bye.